What an amazing bunch of people. Oh, so excited to, uh, to have you here this morning and, uh, and a really warm welcome to you today. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Andrea Nightingale and I have been working for the States of Guernsey for 43 years. Surely not, I hear you gasp. Well, unfortunately for me, it's true. And over those 30 years, and over 30 years, I have been dealing with drug and alcohol issues within our community. Since 2018, as part of the state's partnership of purpose, the then drug and alcohol strategy was included in the newly formed charity, the Health Improvement Commission. I was seconded over to continue my role as coordinator and whilst developing the new combined substance use strategy 2001 to 2026, which now includes tobacco, I became the substance use lead. It's amazing to reflect how the drug and alcohol scene has changed over the years, but I am very proud to be standing here, having never lost my motivation, enthusiasm and determination to reduce the harm caused by substances recognise substance use as a health issue and, wherever possible, encourage a trauma-informed approach to client-centred care. So, why are we here? Well, Steve Gay, who, we, who you will be hearing from shortly, was delivering a workshop as part of the British Irish Council's Housing and Drug and Alcohol Work Set Sectors Joint Symposium held in Dublin last year. This concentrated on developing a joined-up approach and ensure improved outcomes for people who were homeless and used drugs and alcohol. When asked what our standouts were from the conference, and it was a long day, both Grace, at our, harm reduction of, our tobacco harm reduction officer, and I agreed without hesitation that Steve's workshop, How Do We Involve Service Users and Address Stigma Issues, was top of our list. So the seed was sown. Stigma impacts on all aspects of, our, of the lives of people with substance use problems. Stigma affects people, people's well-being and life chances and their ability to seek and get the help, support and treatment they need and deserve. Stigma marginalises people and makes them more vulnerable. Stigma also impacts the families, friends and the wider communities to support those with issues around substance use. I am confident that at the end of our time together, we will be motivated, inspired and armed with new ideas and ways to identify, challenge and reduce stigma within ourselves, our services and our community. So that's enough from me. I'm going to let the experts do the talking. So Harriet, our communications officer, is going to set the scene for us now. Morning, everybody. I'm the communications officer at the Health Improvement Commission, a charity working to empower, enable and encourage healthy living. In my role, a goal is to use non-stigmatising language around weight, diet and activity levels and, of course, substance use, which we're here discussing today. So language, stigma and substance use. All are big topics relating to complex issues which we'll be hearing about from our experts today. So, what are some examples of stigma? They are having inaccurate thoughts, like people using substances are dangerous, that people are to blame for the situation that they're in, and that they're incapable of managing treatment. So, why does this matter, and what does this cause? The literature says that feeling stigmatised can reduce willingness to seek treatment, make others feel pity, anger and desire for distance from people with substance disorders and can even negatively influence healthcare provider perception, therefore impacting treatment. In our small community, how we speak about substance use really matters, so I'm going to highlight a few ways we can make a difference using language choices. We don't have time to go into all of them, but I have provided some handouts which go into more detail. Our team is called Substance Use as this covers prevention as well as treatment work. The term use as opposed to abuse is really important here, as studies show that there is a high association with negative judgment and punishment with the word abuse. I will also highlight the importance of person-first language. 
Words like alcoholics and addict define the person by this area of trouble in their lives. It seems to make the person themselves the issue, rather than saying that they are currently dealing with an issue. It's suggested to instead use phrases such as someone with an alcohol use disorder, rather than alcoholic, and person living with or a person with a substance use disorder. We totally understand that longer can be harder, especially in the media and in casual conversation but it really does matter that we move away from identifying someone completely by their issue. So please do take away my handouts. I find these really useful and I'll send them around afterwards too. It's vital to note that I'm speaking from a public health and public facing treatment services perspective. If individuals prefer to refer to themselves as addicts or alcoholics, it's also so important to support this choice. To sum up, inclusivity via language can impact recovery. Language choices help us include everyone in our community, rather than alienate those living with substance use disorders. I'm always here to help anybody writing about health topics. If you're worried about stigmatising language ever popping up in your work, please do get in touch with me at the Commission. I'm looking forward to chatting with some of you in the breaks and have my details to share. Thank you very much for listening. Up next is Dr Harry Sumnall, who I will now introduce. So, Dr Harry Sumnall is a professor in substance use at the Public Health Institute, Liverpool John Moores University, UK. His funded research programmes have examined the evidence base for harmful substance prevention and the mechanisms for implementing evidence-based practice and policy. Currently, Harry is undertaking a programme of research examining public stigma towards people who use substances and how this might affect support for evidence-based policies. He's known to us locally, having written an independent review commissioned by our public health services on the interaction between the health and justice systems with respect to drug use. He has been interviewed by a local media in relation to this subject and has been following our progress with interest. Thanks very much, Harriet. So I'll just share my screen. And if somebody could just tell me whether this is uh, working OK. And can everybody see my slides on the big screen? I think that was a yes, so I'll carry on. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to talk about this really important topic. Uh, and I do feel that there's been uh, uh, we've had several years of lots of interest in uh, tackling stigma and there's always been good work on this topic. But I really do think, particularly over the last two or three years, there's a real momentum around this. This is a topic which more and more professionals and more and more members of the public, including people who have lived experience, care about and want to tackle. So it's really great that you've decided to focus your uh, conference and, and seminar this, this morning on this topic. And I think when we think, well, why should we tackle stigma? Why should we care about stigma? Now, from one perspective, it's an issue of basic human rights, because we know that the consequences of stigma violate those rights because they reduce access to high quality care and they violate people's opportunities and access to socialisation. So it's important from that perspective. But I think for me, on a really basic level, that when I think about the community that I want to live in, the world that I want to live in, and how I value that world. It's about, well, how do we treat our most vulnerable members? And for me, perhaps more than economic markers around GDP or things like that, actually it's these measures of humanity which really distinguish us as communities and societies. So therefore, I think there's a human rights perspective, there's a public health perspective, but for me, on a really basic level, it's the right thing to do to try and tackle these issues of stigma. But this is complicated when we think about substance use, in particular controlled drugs, because controlled drugs have other meanings, other socially constructed meanings. And often drugs and the people who use drugs are presented as scapegoats for wider societal issues and problems. It becomes a convenient shorthand to describe some of the concerns that we have. And often there's a narrowing of our understanding of those concerns and issues 
uh, whereby everything is reduced to a particular simplistic behaviour and blame is placed on those individuals engaging in their behaviour. And sometimes this is done because uh, 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 initiatives to address these wider de determinants of these complex problems are difficult. It's difficult to do. Now, of course, I'm based uh, here in England. And we're in the middle of a, a drugs deaths crisis here in England and Wales. So uh, in 2021, the highest ever level of drug related deaths, eight people a day died uh, from a, a drug related causes. That does include overdoses, but quite interestingly, after the age of about 40, uh, around about the mid 40s, uh, the majority of drug related deaths aren't associated with overdose, at least in England, but long term conditions. So that's telling us something about that the risk profile is moving away from drug markets and drugs that are available to the types of care that are offered to people. And this is where stigma also becomes important because, as Harriet mentioned in her opening remarks, it can affect the quality of services received and the outcomes of those of those services. And I think it's always important to remember that behind these statistics, behind these graphs, there's always a human story and a human face. So I'm based in Liverpool and very close to the university. Tragically, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had the death of Amy Teese, who was only 30. And she was described in, in a rather compassionate piece in local media as a bright and bubbly young mum full of life. You know, uh, she'd had her struggles, she'd had her difficulties, but she had a life ahead of her. She was somebody's friend. She was somebody's daughter and she was somebody's mum. But she died alone in a tent uh, next to these abandoned flats that you can see in the picture. Similarly, we have Richard uh, Kehoe, uh, age 40, described as a nice lad who was really well liked by his friends. Uh, again, somebody who had, who'd, uh, 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 was experiencing problems in his life but was committed to addressing these and to helping other people. And tragically, Richard died literally within steps of the Royal Liverpool Hospital. You can see that big grey building in the bottom right. And he died at the side of those flats, you know, literally across the road from the hospital. These are just two of those thousands of examples that we see. There's a human story behind all of these statistics. So, so why do we have such high levels of drug related deaths? and other types of drug related harm. And I mentioned before in my earlier slide, uh, talking about when we think about uh, substance use problems and the health and social harms associated with that, and the life stories of people who are experiencing those issues, uh, uh, it's not just about the drugs. You know, often people have other concerns. Uh, for example, data from uh, OHID in England, looking at treatment profiles, clients in treatments, a high proportion have urgent housing problems or only or in temporary accommodation. Uh, a high level of unmet mental health treatment need and worryingly for treatment providers, there's been an increase, a gradual increase in the number of deaths of people already in treatment. Now, traditionally, treatment has always been protective against drug related deaths, but something is happening about the care received if we're seeing an increase in deaths. Is stigma playing a role here? And is it present, presenting some barriers to addressing some of these additional concerns? But we know what to do. We know how to address all of these types of issues. There's been lots of guidance. There's lots of really good work out there, including in Guernsey, you know, trying to address some of these harms and address some of these fundamental causes. So we know what to do. It's uh, looking at housing, it's about treatment and harm reduction, it's about prevention, it's focusing on long term health conditions. And of course, it's also about tackling those social determinants, tough but di difficult and difficult to do, but really important poverty, deprivation and absence of opportunities. We know what to do, but often we don't have this public, community and political commitment to that. And we know there's variations in provision, coverage and quality, and there's probably many different approaches that we could try, which might have more success, might be uh, beneficial on recovery journeys, but for various reasons, including controversies, social attitudes, we don't pursue those. 
And I think stigma is uh, a, a partly a cause of that. And again, as Harriet said, we know that stigma through, through many studies, and we'll, we know it through people's, what people tell us and lived experiences, that stigma is a major barrier to provision of these types of services and uptake of support. So what is stigma? So I know Steve and Sarah are going to focus on this in a bit more detail in their workshops. So I'm, I'm just going to really focus on some top level findings and discussions here whilst they'll go into the details. So just as a definition. So when we talk about stigma, I think it's perhaps a an uncomfortable reality that in various ways we all stigmatize other people and other groups. In part, it's 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 a basis of our identity formation particularly during late adolescence. Uh, we form our own identities and say, uh, sense of self and who we belong with, who is our group, by comparison and contrasting with others. You know, that, that's a natural and normal thing to do. Where that gets a problem, becomes a problem, is where that differentiation leads to discrimination, fear and avoidance. So on a technical basis, stigma refers to stereotypes, negative attitudes and beliefs held by the public about other people with so-called devalued characteristics. And this has been extended to break those characteristics down into discredited and discreditable characteristics or identities. So discredited identities are those which are visible. This could be gender, it could be race, it could be behaviour. So if we're thinking about substance use, a lot of that is public, so that could be discredited, but also discreditable. And these are these are identities and behaviours which are less well observed, but have the potential to cause stigmatisation. And again, drug use could be important here, but health status and social status. And that's important because there's often an interaction between those characteristics, which can actually increase the levels of stigmatisation, almost a uh, a negative synergistic, synergistic effect. Now, I mentioned before that stigmatisation and differentiation, it's a normal thing, in inverted commas, that we all do. And a lot of this is imperceptible. You know, it's quite trivial. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we form differences with others based upon the car we drive, the football team we support, uh, the music we like, which is particularly important if you're a teenager, for example. But where it becomes an issue is where it leads to this social distance and discrimination. And I think something which is also important is that discrimination is allowed where there's power differentials between groups and between individuals. Uh, groups feel as if they have the power to enact stigma and to produce this discrimination. If we didn't have those power differentials, we probably wouldn't have these extreme outcomes of stigma. There's different types of stigma, and I suspect, although I'm not sure that Steve will cover some of these uh, in, in his workshop, but some of the main ones, so public stigma, we've spoken about already, stigma by association, and I'll say a few words about the stigma experienced by family members and carers in a moment. Self-stigma, so this can be internalised stigma, where people begin to believe some of those stereotypes. This is really important about access to care. People either feel they're not worthy of support or they're worried and concerned about the views that other people might have about them if they attend those services. So self stigma is really important. Structural discrimination is also really important as well. And when I think about stigma, and I'd highly recommend this model and framework to you all, uh, and uh, you, you can Google this and find out a bit more about it. I like to refer to this framework called the Health Stigma and Discrimination Framework. Now, this was originally developed in relation to HIV, so the stigma associated with HIV. And the reason why I like this is because it doesn't distinguish between the stigmatizer and the stigmatizee. Yes, it says that's important. So how we treat other people, that's important. But it recognises that that stigma and those power differentials are actually produced on an individual, a community, an organisational, an organisational and at a policy and structural level as well. What happens at a policy and structural and environmental level affects how individuals interact and treat each other within communities. And I won't go into the details here because there's quite a lot of information, but this model talks about different drivers and facilitators, how this manifests 
and how this leads to people's experiences of care, for example. Highly recommended. And I think there's a handout which I, I've asked to be distributed and there's a link to this as well. Highly recommended you look at this. And there's various theories about why stigma arises. And, and, and again, just very briefly, I don't want to bombard you with theory. This is one that I like. This is called the attribution theory. And this is uh, uh, helps us to understand how and why people make those decisions about groups and individuals affected by stigma. So the theory basically says that when we have a group or individual that we don't have a high level of familiarity with, so most people don't have regular contact with people who use substances such as heroin, for example. We look for signals about what to think about that individual or a group. And those signals come through media, they come through public and political discussions, and perhaps also through personal experience and perceptions. And when we see or observe one of these signaling events, it uh, activates particular cognitive pathways and we make decisions about the controllability of that behaviour. Is that individual or group in control of their behaviour? And if we think that somebody is in control of that behaviour, that that activity is a choice, a deliberate choice, we activate, uh, well, sorry, we assign responsibility to them. Or if we think that that behaviour is largely uncontrollable, that it's partly or mostly a result of external forces, constrained choices, people's environments, we tend to think they're not responsible for, for, for those behaviours and the outcomes. And then this uh, generates uh, uh, an, emo an emotional response, either pity or anger. So if we think somebody is not uh, responsible for their behaviour, we're more likely to have pity and compassion and want to help them. We want to support them. Or if we think they're responsible for their behaviour, it's more likely to generate anger and we're more likely to validate or seek punishing behaviours in all its various forms, including discrimination and including our preferences for the types of support that those individuals might receive. And that's moderated by characteristics such as age, gender, co-occurring behaviours, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a really interesting way of understanding how these stigmatising attitudes arise and how we can begin to tackle them. So just thinking about the media, so here's just a couple of examples from, from the UK. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the situation is like in, in Guernsey, but certainly in the UK, we often see stigmatising pictures and headlines like this. So here we have best drugs deterrent ever, shocking police mugshot, shows impact of years of crack and heroin addiction. The individual involved uh, has no one to blame but herself. This is a classic signaling event. The impact of substance use on appearance, so highly visible, and the key phrase here about the blame and responsibility. Similarly, we often see dehumanising language, so associated with some types of drug use, there was a period of time where people using those substances would be described as zombies or hulks uh, because of the, some of the strange overt uh, phenomenology of substance use. So we can see, particularly through the media, why these, uh, uh, these signalling events are important. And this is common across all types of regular reporting on substance use issues. Yes, we have some really extreme headlines such as uh, using disparaging language, which I won't repeat here, but you can read for yourself in the top left. Uh, a focus on crime. So in local media in particular, a focus on drug related crime, mug shots, uh, not really focusing on the background story to this, focusing on the impact on communities, wh which is important. You know, that's not to uh, deny the impact of crime but it provides a constant and continuous narrative for the general public on what to think about people who use substances. Just like serious mental illness, they're depicted as mad, bad and dangerous to know. Uh, without going into too much detail, as I mentioned before, drugs are often used as functional scapegoats. Uh, and this is often used in party politics, certainly in the United Kingdom, I'm not sure about Guernsey, where drugs and the people who use them are almost used as puppets in these political party political activities, a way to attack other political parties by seemingly pre presenting them as being soft on crime, for example. That's a common attack line at the expense of people 
who are uh, 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 suffering problems with, around their drug use. But this matters, as Heather and Andrea said, and, and I was glad that Andrea said that the focus in Guernsey is on trauma-informed approaches, and Heather spoke about experiences of care. Sorry, Harriet spoke about experiences of care. That This is really important. It can provide a barrier to access to care. It's also associated with uh, 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 poorer quality care and more negative outcomes as well. And partly this is around professional stigma. And then sadly, this can occur across a range of caring services, including in drug treatment services. So uh, often professionals, uh, less so in the more specialist services, perhaps thinking here about more general health and social care, they have stigmatizing attitudes towards clients, uh, and this can lead to uh, stigmatizing discriminatory views. So people are morally culpable for their condition. Uh, uh, clients are viewed as more in intimidating and untrustworthy, and sometimes less valuable than other clients or patients. And sometimes there can be professional stigma between professional sectors as well, whereby there's devaluing of those professionals who are working directly with these clients. And this can affect uh, career pathways, it, it can affect how attractive a particular career is, it can affect uh, 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 things such as uh, preferences and priorities with regards to spending plans. So stigma cut, cuts across all aspects of the care pathway. It can also affect families in particular, and here is what we call, uh, here's where we refer, refer to affiliative stigma. And families are often seen to be contaminated by that stigmatizing condition. And this can be internalized and families and carers come to believe that external criticism. And here we have a few quotes from a study looking at the experiences of families around drug related deaths, the sorts of negative responses that bereaved families in their moment of crisis got from so-called friends, neighbours or even doctors and support workers. And this can also manifest in different ways. So typically, as there is greater familiarity, greater level of familiarity with substance use issues, stigma tends to decrease. But if you think about a family that's internalised or a carer that's internalised this stigma, who on a day-to-day -day basis are dealing with the burden, the caregiving burden, and the fact that they begin to associate their caregiving activity with how others are treating them, uh, and uh, just just the, the, just the, the mere burden this produces, this can actually lead to stigma towards a family member. So uh, I think this is a, probably a topic uh, that probably gets a lot less attention than it deserves. Something we really need to focus on. This also manifests at policy support level as well. So we've done quite a bit of work and, and naturally, you know, this doesn't surprise us at all, but it's it's I think it's important to confirm this, that in terms of public preference for what they want decision makers and policy makers to do, including spending and economic support for different treatment services and policies, stigma is hugely important here. And this is particularly important in an environment where there's perhaps reduced resources, uh, where difficult spending decisions have to be made. Uh, the public will have a preference for spending in some areas compared to others based upon levels of stigma. And of course, policy makers and decision makers are also members of the public, and this can affect some of those spending decisions as well. There's, there's quite a lot of research on this. And there's uh, lots of studies and lots of investigations, in, including our own, about how stigma impacts all aspects of life, <clears throat> and particularly about how people learn about, uh, develop these stigmatizing attitudes. Just want to just want to pick up a couple of years ones here that I think are important. Uh, I, I think in, in a lot of discussions around the impact of substance use, uh, there's a silencing of the voices or an absence of the voices of people with lived experience who use substances. Uh, there's often, particularly in media, a, a, an, an unhelpful characterization of treatment and support, support responses, often a narrowing of a focus of the particular treatment options available. And of course, uh, particularly in media, there's a moral judgment against these behaviours, but strangely not a moral judgment around a lack of response and often lack of care towards affected groups. 
So it doesn't seem to work both ways. And a narrative about, uh, and this is common with mental health as well, about what is wrong with these people rather than what happened has happened to these people. And I think that points to this, that truly trauma informed care that Andrea was talking about before. And our studies have actually shown that stigma can actually uh, be even more problematic. And some of these stigmatizing attitudes actually run deeper. And our studies have actually shown this dehumanization, particularly of people who use some drugs like heroin. And this is in comparison to the general population, but also other stigmatized groups, such as people who are homeless, people with serious mental illness. This seems to be unique to uh, use of some types of substances. And this can uh, manifest in different ways. But basically, it's about the sense of humanity, the qualities of humanity. People rate people who use heroin, for example, as less than human, as not having the same type as emotional response. They describe them with different uh, adjectives and language. Uh, we, we gave members of the public uh, these two uh, uh, assessments that you can see here on the right. This at uh, the top uh, right is the ascent of man. And we asked them to compare different groups about how evolved in inverted commas they thought different groups were and people who use heroin were deemed as much less evolved. And as I mentioned before, when asked to uh, use particular words to describe people who use heroin, they tended not to use the types of words that were used to typically describe human emotions, humanity itself. So I think it actually extends beyond stigmatization to dehumanization as well. So what do we do about this? This, of course, is the big issue. There's lots of work now on what stigma is, what experiences the stigmatization are. And, you know, that's great. It's really good that we do that work, but it's really important now we move on. What can we do about this? So I think it's fair to say that in the substance use field, the evidence is limited, but there's lots to draw upon in other fields, particularly mental health and HIV. And for those of you with a bit of time, I'd recommend you look at the Lancet Commission on Ending Stigma and Discrimination in Mental Health. Some fantastic resources and they summarise the evidence here. So guidelines and educational resources, particularly for decision makers and service providers, really important. Public education initiatives. There's a really uh, large, well-funded initiative in the UK called Time to Change, which had direct impact on public attitudes towards mental health. That can be done. It's difficult, it's expensive, but it can be done. Contact interventions between uh, professionals in training, but also post-qualification. And this is particularly in more general health and social care with affected groups, that's important. Legislation is sometimes an option around uh, anti-discrimination legislation, but perhaps also protest and advocacy. And by protest, I don't mean gluing yourself to a road or smashing up Van Gogh's sunflowers or things like that, but challenging some of these represent representations of, of these issues that we care about in the media, for example. I need to acknowledge, of course, that the evidence base in the substance use field is relatively limited, but there's some roots here, some suggestions about what we can do about this. Uh, some fantastic resources, as I've mentioned, particularly around the use of language that Harriet mentioned, uh, but also guidance for media. The, the, the key thing here and the challenge, of course, is to encourage and motivate people, our colleagues in the media, to use these sorts of toolkits, particularly as they face the pressures of uh, the challenges of social media or reduced circulation. Uh, or reduce sales and reduce advertising buys. You know, sensation sells, clickbait sells, but I think engagement with media is really important. We spoke about, or Harriet, sorry, spoke about before about this person first language. And I, I absolutely agree with everything that she says. And it's some, sometimes this is a bit of a minefield and people trip up and really worry about language. So it's important that we don't police language. You know, we don't criticise and have really negative views. People use the wrong words, but it's about, you know, slowly and subtly motivating people away from noun based language such as addict or substance abuser to more person first language. And we know from some of our studies and other studies as well that language is really important in modifying those stigmatising attitudes. Something to keep in mind, though, is that we can change our language but if our behaviours and attitudes don't change, then it's almost a tick box exercise. But it's an important first start. 
So we need to think about some of the campaigns. So there's a really fantastic campaign in, in the UK called Support Not Stigma. Uh, and it was actually supported by the Princess of Wales. Uh, so, you know, fantastic visibility. It's great that she was involved and cares about this. But some of the language is problematic. It talks about addicts and addiction. And again, this suggests sometimes personal culpability and a lack of controllability. And sometimes the use of the term addiction can point to biological and disease models. So for, for professionals, we understand this. We know what that uh, those models suggest. But for the general public, they have a different interpretation. They sometimes think that a biological or a disease model means that something uh, that a condition will affect somebody for the rest of their life. And they have almost a uh, pes pessimistic prognosis around this, uh, that they believe that people can't recover. So we need to be very careful about our language and our words. Uh, and I said before about it, we need to think about uh, explaining, particularly to the general public, not what's wrong with people, but what people have experienced. And indeed, in some of our research that we published a, a couple of years ago, we found actually presenting cases, in this case, looking at adverse life histories and adverse childhood experiences. This was a really good way of framing substance use to the general public. And when we did this, compared to using some of the typical pejorative words uh, that are often used in public discussion, it was associated with much lower stigmatizing attitudes and greater support for treatment and harm reduction interventions. So language and framing is important, telling people stories, uh, exploring that trauma and adversity is really important, I think. In terms of professional activity, so in, in, in the UK, uh, I'm very pleased and honoured to be part of a, a new initiative, which is going to be soft launched in March, but fully launched in, in April. And colleagues in Guernsey, once it's launched, are, are more than welcome to join this. So this is the Anti-Stigma Network, and this is a network of professionals, uh, members of the public, academics, people with lived experience. It's almost like an, an umbrella uh, organisation, a collective, trying to coordinate some of these activities and working with policymakers, media, etc. Uh, really just to provide a central and visible and continuous focus. So we're not just focusing on individual campaigns, but really applying the pressure to really address stigma. So it would be great if colleague, any colleagues in, in Guernsey would want to join that once it's launched. Please get in touch. Lots of other campaigns, high profile campaigns. Uh, click on the link here, stigmakills.org.uk. Uh, talks about some of these issues in more detail. So this particular campaign in 2022, uh, their tagline was on see the person, hear their story. So moving away from the nouns and pejorative language about the story, the complex life histories of adversity and challenge, but also the positive aspects of that as people engage in recovery. A really good example from the Scottish government, and I think this is probably the first I've encountered, a national campaign to address the stigma associated with substance use. Uh, this was funded by the Scottish government, implemented by a trusted brand, NHS Scotland, uh, and this was about uh, asking the public to rethink their perceptions of drug use issues. Uh, in this case, for, uh, a framing is around uh, health issues rather than making moral judgments. Uh, so, you know, the tagline, no, I'm not well, I have a drug problem, a drug or alcohol problem is a health condition. People should receive help and support, not judgment. So it was great that the Scottish government put some money into that. And I think it's really important that we celebrate and support recovery in all its forms. Certainly in the UK, I'm not sure if it's the same in Guernsey. We often separate ourselves into ideological camps about whether we're focused on abstention or harm reduction. And even some medicines and treatments are stigmatized. There seems to be changing and increasing negative attitudes towards opiate agonist therapies in the UK, for example. You know, let's ignore that, celebrate and support recovery in all its forms and tell those stories to the public that treatment, support and harm reduction works. This is not uh, an inevitable and disastrous and negative condition people do recover. Let's challenge the media as well. With regards to uh, mental health, the Time to Change campaign that I mentioned before really drove this. And this was uh, uh, initiatives to really tackle some of these negative and pejorative and stigmatizing headlines. Uh, so really engaging with editors, making appropriate complaints to particular bodies, 
Uh, so back in the 80s and 90s, uh, language like Psycho Cabbies or Bonkers Bruno, the famous boxer Frank Bruno or Mad Men and things like that. We don't really see that discussion and those that framing of mental health these days, uh, although there is some stigmatization about some treatment. Where we see similar headlines and stories around substance use, let's tackle that in a supportive and non-confrontational way. Let's engage with editors and journalists and remind them about how this could be harmful. And it doesn't serve their readership or their viewers well because it tells a distorted story. OK, that's me finished. Uh, please do contact me or, or connect with me on social media. So stigma is a public health problem. I'll go through this relatively quick, I think, just for time, because I do have ADHD. I do tend to waffle quite a bit, so I'll try to be as concise as possible. So before we begin, a uh, very quick thing. I'm not here today as a Government of Jersey employee. This is one of those things I feel really passionate about. I'll do this in my own time. It also means I can say things slightly differently than if I was here as a government representative. The downside is I can't tell you about what we're doing in Jersey, uh, unless it's already in the media purely because the strategy I'm working on hasn't yet gone to the Council of Ministers and I can't really let them find out through the Guernsey Press or anything like that. <laughs> so there we go. There's also a few little bits of humour just to try and engage different parts of the brain because again, coming from a psychology background, I like to do things like that. I did plan a little experiment, which unfortunately I couldn't do, but something else happened yesterday, which I'll go into in a minute. So we've got, yep. Here's an individual. Uh, the way I describe myself, I suppose, is I was a scientist practitioner. So I studied all the theory, um, did some research, and then started working with more and more people in more diverse backgrounds. I worked in um, the community at our drug and alcohol service, worked in the prison as well. I then began lecturing at Highlands, um, training counsellors. I've done quite a few different things and then moved into policy. And the whole journey there, as I was working through all these things, was that I couldn't really solve the issue. So when I was working in the community, I'd have however many clients I used to see and couldn't really get any long lasting change after a while. There was all the relapses, people in and out of prison. Um, there was all the other issues in the background like housing, um, the stigma as well, accessing training, all these things that I couldn't do on my sort of part time hours working there. And likewise in the prison, I couldn't do things out in the community. So moving to policy was how I thought I could try and change some of these things at these wider levels uh, and try to connect all the dots as I went. Um, yep, so my interests around research at the moment are again around stigma and substance use. And some of the words and phrases I kind of use in this, they're not what I would use, it's more just to show and demonstrate some of the points. And we've heard some of those already today. So in the background, um, I also work in weekend welfare. So this is a third sector harm reduction service I set up in Jersey to do welfare at events and things like that. These are just my conflicts of interest that sometimes pop up. I'm also a member of the Society for the Study of Addiction. Um, so again, I'm looking at some work around that on medicinal cannabis, how it interacts with people with addictions and how society prescribers kind of view all that. And also I'm looking into psychedelics and how that can work in policy and how it all fits together. That's all the things I'm involved in at the moment. So over to me. So taking one look at me, which of these do you think are the most um, believable? That I surf every opportunity, that I've used over 20 drugs, or I'm able to perform marriage ceremonies in Jersey. <laughs> Quick show of hands for the first one. What do you think? There's a few smirks, a couple of hands. Yep, okay. Second one, use over 20 drugs. A couple of smirks again. Wedding ceremonies? Yeah, that's actually true. Um, <laughs> so somehow I ended up uh, when I was at college, got bored, I think, um, got ordained online as a minister of religion in California. Um, thought it could be useful one day, and then I found out two weeks ago when Jersey changed the law for same-sex marriages a couple of years ago, the way they had to do it because the law was so old was to open it up to everybody. So overnight I suddenly realised I could actually perform marriage ceremonies if I wanted to. But again, it's just the way that you take a look at somebody and you kind of get these ideas um, and kind of how it works from there. So this happened to me yesterday in a strange way, where I, I don't usually wear a suit like this. I generally just wear trousers and a shirt and maybe a tie. A tie if it's a minister meeting or with stakeholders. Very, very rarely wear a jacket. It's only for when I really care about something really important, like an interview or something like that. But because I was travelling, I thought I'll wear it rather than scrunch it up in my bag. Got to the airport in Guernsey, waiting for a taxi. Um, three other people with suits were standing there and we ended up just starting chatting about random things as you do to pass the time. Uh, the person I was talking to, we realised the taxi had been about 20 minutes, nothing had arrived. 
So he said, oh, I can get his friend to take us a lift instead. So he was ringing his friend. I was trying to get hold of a taxi. Um, long story short, he then sort of paid for the taxi as well, dropped me off here and continued on his way. Really nice guy. Um, but if I turned up in jeans, T-shirt, um, maybe a pair of shorts, you could see some of my tattoos, my hair was down. I don't think that would have happened in the same way. Uh, I probably would have been ignored whilst the sort of two other people with suits spoke to each other and I would have been left there. And again, not taking it personally, but I think that's the way, the way I see it is how this generally works. There's a lot of these unconscious biases where you're not necessarily aware of the judgments you make. Uh, again, the stereotypes that are going on and the way that's kind of fed into those beliefs again. And again, just the ignorance of not knowing that, not knowing that I am this senior person in Jersey, um, that I do have an educated background. But when you see my scruffy clothes at the weekends, um, or I've been doing some DIY and I'm covered in paint, you're gonna think all sorts of things probably. And just quickly going over these, we've touched on them before um, throughout um, Harriet and Henry speaking, but we've got the, sorry, Harry, we've got kind of biases, so that how you feel connected to people like yourself and that kind of identity in grouping, things like that. Um, you've also got perception bias, so again, where the stereotypes about particular groups come from, which again is really strong in the kind of alcohol and drug world and lots of other health issues as well. And then these kind of halo and horn effects, where again, as you picture a community or a type of people, you then kind of demonize them or think they must be amazing based on, again, all these kind of ideas. And the stereotypes, a lot of those, again, come from the media, as we've talked about, and also your kind of friendship groups, maybe workplaces, the culture in those areas. You can also get it through laws and policies, where, again, some of the wording, so in Jersey, we've got a law called the, I think, Misuse of Drugs Addicts Law, which makes it illegal to prescribe to someone who's an addict um, unless you're, you have a license from the health minister. And it's from the 1970s, and it just the idea was it's to protect overprescribing and kind of killing people through giving too much drugs. But again, the way that was written, it's not really how we'd want to be by today's standards. And again, the ignorance, a lot of that's just, again, they're not knowing, not looking into things, not exploring things. And sometimes it's that aversion. If you've heard lots of bad things about people that use drugs or alcohol or any of these other problems, you don't really want to talk to them to find out what's going on. Because again, it's this sort of inbuilt, unconscious thing that's going on here. As a psychologist, this is what's always interested me, is how we can kind of break some of these things down, how we can move forward and stop it becoming this kind of bouncing, almost cycle of everything going from there. So over to public health. So the technical kind of description that always comes across is that it's the science and art of promoting, protecting health and well-being, uh, preventing ill health, prolonging life through the organised effects of society. And that's where in public health, I can't go out and do everything. Uh, my colleagues can't do the same but we work with all the different areas of society to try and get these same kind of aims. So you've got things like with the protecting, you're kind of protecting from viruses, um, environmental problems, all that sort of side. Health promotions around keeping you generally healthy. And then the preventing is again, all these kind of issues, early deaths, sort of addiction, if you're thinking of the extreme end. And again, they all mix together. So you're not just doing one thing, you're trying to do all of these at once. Okay, so we've got, all these different ways we can do that. You can kind of try to get change around schools so that schools um, look at young people differently when they're using drugs in school or caught with drugs in school. You could look at how charities are working together. You can look at how the workplaces themselves do this. What are the policies if you have a staff member who comes in drunk one day and it's because they're you know, just having a four day bender because it's their birthday versus they're actually addicted to it. What's the policy on that? What does that actually mean? Are they now gonna lose their job for having an addiction basically? So there's things like that that you can try to influence um, when you're kind of working in this area that really falls under this health and all policies approach of every policy should have a focus on health, which for me, by extension, should be stigma as well. But we'll go into that in a little bit more. So I won't do this very longly, but we've kind of talked about this already. We kind of know who's affected by stigma, um, loads of different groups. An easy way to look at it might be, as we've already sort of said, it's people with differences and how we perceive those differences. So it could be different groups, it could be your general kind of race, gender, sexual orientation, lifestyle choices, anything of those that's kind of different to us, again, internally, psychologically, that's where these things start to appear. Perpetuated again by all that kind of media side and that kind of cycle I mentioned before. <coughs> this also kind of falls into what we call the at-risk groups um, in public health, where we know in these groups, health outcomes are a lot worse. Um, and again, a lot of the things in place kind of can prevent you from getting better as well even though you're trying to help, there could be a block somewhere on the way that just stops it. So getting access to treatment services, for example, or with drugs in particular, the fact that they're illegal makes it really hard to tell people that you're using a drug because of fear of being arrested. 
or again that judgment of what else do you do at the weekend? Do you steal this? Do you do that? And those kind of ideas from there. So the way I've kind of come to see it is that really stigma is kind of everywhere. It's everybody's problem in a way. We all have these unconscious biases. Again, don't feel too bad. Everybody does that. But it's making sure we don't keep perpetuating these issues. And this diagram just covers broadly the things we do in public health, all the kind of different areas. And again, you pick any of these, you can find something there that will be a source of stigma or a way that it causes issues. So things like healthcare, we've talked about. If you've got, for example, nurses or doctors that don't understand, that don't want to work with people that have used drugs or, or alcohol in that way, it's really hard to recruit. Or you might end up recruiting kind of the wrong people almost that don't understand those issues. You then look at things like, again, education. So when I was at school, I was taught if you use drugs, you're a bad person, basically. That was kind of how I grew up. That's the education in our schools. And it was to try and stop us from using drugs. Um, that was really difficult, going to university, learning about behavior, why people use drugs, trauma, and trying to understand how what I was taught in school kind of fits into the real world. And again, all of that got worse when I started working with people with these problems and realizing, actually, you're not bad. You've just had a lot of terrible things happen throughout your life that keep happening. Um, so yeah, so that kind of covers how I see stigma fits into all these different areas. And again, all of these you can challenge at different points. And the other key thing is, again, you don't tend to fall into one of these categories as well. You could have all these other things going on, making somebody much, much more complex. So again, multiple layers of stigma as well, around kind of drug use, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, all of those things can combine, making it really hard for some even smaller groups there. So one way to look at this again, if we think about the definition of public health, it's almost like the opposite of, well, stigma could be seen as an opposite. So it's almost this idea that stigma obstructs and neglects health and well-being um, because it kind of causes these problems in an unorganized way. And by unorganized, I mean it's that automatic behavior that the media have, that we might have, people that really haven't got a clue about this area have. It's not coordinated necessarily, but it's just the kind of default. But again, it causes all these problems. So I'm starting to now kind of picture it as this kind of opposite to public health, um, that it just gets in the way. And likewise, in the policy world, sometimes it means that a particular policy that affects a small number of people, like people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol compared to the whole population, can get pushed aside because the more important things could be those that affect, you know, 90% of the population rather than the small amount that are addicted. And this is where the bit I can talk about from what I do, trying to change that. So it's, again, like Guernsey have, a substance use strategy. So you're broadening it out, making people aware that if you drink, if you smoke, if you use drugs or even medicine sometimes, you kind of fall in this category. But yeah, you're not at the extreme end, but you are somewhat involved here. And that does help to kind of change the way people see this, that it is a bit bigger than you might think by only focusing on those extremes. So what it can look like, so we've kind of covered these, so there's that discrediting effect where you kind of, kind of think you can't trust people, um, you're not really in pain, there's discounting. So actually, I see this sometimes with health professionals, where they won't want to prescribe because somebody has a history of addiction and it becomes this automatic battle of, well, actually, if I give you these pain meds, you might do this, you might do that, and ignoring the pain that's still going on, and the cycle that actually the drug use could be for the pain because they're not getting the right help. And you've got the degrading, so again, the way that um, we kind of, society can degrade these kind of people and degrade um, the idea of getting better as well with these labels, it will last forever, that kind of thing. And then the discriminating, so again, um, we had this recently where I had an ex-client of mine in prison who was training to be a counsellor, was really, really keen, really proactive, um, wanted to come to Highlands College and continue it when he came out, and was asking out how he can kind of join. And because of the drugs conviction and being in prison, he wouldn't be able to get on the course, which then caused this other problem of how do you then get people with lived experience working in these kind of areas? And again, it's those kind of policies and things in place that just put a block to that, which again is really demoralizing if you've sat in prison for a couple of years, tried to change everything around and thought, I can do this really well, I really want to help people and then find out, unfortunately, I think weeks before he was due to leave, that you can't progress this, and somebody should have said that probably right at the start. So we could at least try and set something up. Then you've got, again, the dehumanizing, so the way all these labels become kind of the problem. And a quick way to demonstrate that is you kind of see this issue where you've got somebody struggling with something, and it could be the alcohol use, the drug use, and very quickly, all the labels appear from society. Um, they get Again, internalized, it becomes a self-stigma then. You can start to feed into this. You can start to think, well, actually, maybe I've struggled for the last 10 years. Maybe this is how I am. The rest of my life will be like this, so why bother? And you can get all those things, again, just making the issue worse. What you generally don't see 
is all the other things that are kind of led to this. So again, all that trauma, all the other ways that society may not be helping, and then all the other struggles that are going on, which again combine to all this. So all those other areas that could become uh, kind of stigmatic points as well, the way that you could be constantly ignored by passerby when you're asking for help, um, being the first to blame. So quite often we see this with young people as well. So if there's ever a bit of crime in Jersey, usually it's, oh, it must be kids, you know, they're up to no good again. What are the teenagers doing? And you kind of think, well, what were they doing in that place? Because there's no buses there at that time. How did that happen? But again, it's that, who do we blame? It's people that are drinking, people that are, you know, doing things they don't want them to do. So again, all of this kind of feeds into this kind of big cycle and messy ball of kind of stigma. And one of the reasons why I say we can't do anything um, is that again, you get this kind of stigma cycle going where, this is very simplified by the way, but where you've got these unconscious sort of sides going on. When you look to drugs and alcohol abuse, uh, sorry, I'm a phrase there, abuse, and the way it's seen as abuse, you get this problem where the stigma kind of drives the idea that again, discrimination is okay because almost like that's a separate type of person, it's okay to talk about them like that. That then feeds into the use again that drugs, sorry, justifies the use that drugs are bad uh, and illegal, and then criminalization use continues, which again means that you need to give this kind of extra negative slant from the media, just as a reminder that drugs are bad, if you do it, you're a bad person, like I was taught at school. And all this just keeps going around in circles and we don't really achieve anything. But when we look to public health, uh, that's where we kind of have to change some of this because for me, as a public health issue, which does alcohol, drug use, tobacco, medicines, performance enhancing drugs, it affects so much people in the island, same as with Guernsey, I'm sure, that we can't be this extreme end problem. We need to look at the whole thing and start looking at all these cycles that are getting in the way. So that's the kind of approach I've been taking in the couple of years I've been working in this area. Uh, and again, just a quick reminder, we covered this, but uh, one of the things I found when I was looking into the, um, I used to see it was the problem of kind of two different clients when I worked face to face in the old days. Where I had some people that I'd see within a couple of weeks, they do amazingly well, disappear from the service, and never see them again. Other people in and out every other week, um, I'd go up to the prison uh, and they'd be in there. And then I'd come out and be in the community again, doing a bit more work there. And I'd bump into them in the police station or somewhere else. And it was just this confusion in the early days when I worked in this, why, the, what's going on here? Why are some people more complicated than others almost to solve these issues? And that's when I realized it wasn't the people necessarily, it's everything that's happened to them. It's all that, again, that below that iceberg effect. And again, it's that, it's out my hands here. We need policies, we need this community approach. We need so much more to go on. And again, to disrupt some of these cycles is kind of the way forward. So here's what we can do. So when I was looking into this, uh, this was back in my master's days, that stigma was generally considered to be most destructive um, when it's basically kind of hidden. So we don't talk about it. Um, or it's misrecognized. So you might get excuses on why you may have said something or why an article was actually okay. And I did challenge one of our local papers, or the only paper at the time, a few years back, when there was a, there was a client of mine actually who was arrested for, I think it was shoplifting alcohol. And the way they wrote about it, they said something like, you know, alcohol addict or alcoholic, um, arrested for this and that. But I was kind of trying to prod them and say, well, why have you picked up on the alcoholic part? But obviously if that's a health issue, isn't there some clause in ethics around, you know, somebody's medical history? How does that work? And, you know, just trying to get out of them, what's your understanding here? So not pushing too hard, but just trying to work out what it was. Didn't really get an answer back. Um, after several attempts, eventually got an answer that, a bit wishy-washy, but, you know, it's in the public interest. And I thought, really? Does the public really care about somebody who's stolen a bottle of vodka because they're going to withdrawals? Um, and if they do, is that a call to arms to say, we need to do something here, we need more support? rather than just another way to justify why we shouldn't like certain people. So I wasn't quite happy with that, but again, something to look at as part of what I'm hoping to do when the strategy launches. So down here, we've got Sunset Kobo. So again, if you can't recognize the problems, um, you can't really deal with them. So this is kind of the approach we're looking at for today, really, is to try and stop this um, sort of hiddenness around sort of stigma and try to recognize it. So the solution really, again, is kind of find it and recognize it. So again, think about all the ways oh, that it interacts and get used to these ideas and start thinking around these cycles of, you might come across this in a few weeks, something might happen, someone might say something, and it might just be a moment of, oh yeah, that's where, that's now part of a barrier, it's causing the cycle again. So final thoughts really. So again, we do all these things automatically. Um, it's not something to feel bad about. One of the interesting ones I've come across is by someone called Ronald Siegel. Anybody come across him before, his work? A couple of nods. 
So I think it was the 60s or 70s, they did a lot of research on animals and looking at humans and how and why people use drugs. And one of the ideas he had is that really intoxication um, is kind of like human nature because for centuries, thousands of years, there's always been drug use somewhere. But you fast forward to kind of modern society and it's demonized. And then you've got the issues around it's okay if it's alcohol, it's okay if it's tobacco, but you know, drugs, heroin, this, that, definitely not. Uh, and again, that weird inconsistency there that it is almost an inbuilt, uh, as he argued, almost universal construct in that even elephants um, were known to do it and also had similar patterns from his research where he basically found that if you give elephants, as you do back in the 60s and 70s, sort of vats of wine, um, they will drink it quite happily, um, but they'll drink it more when they're upset. So after the death of one of their um, sort of herd, they went back to the area, they were trying to get more alcohol again. Um, and initially it was just, I think, to see how much alcohol do you need to get an elephant drunk? Because apparently that's interesting research. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so then it then turned into this idea he had around you can use this as a proxy almost for are animals kind of happy and likewise are humans happy. So as a society, if you have large amounts of people sort of drinking too much, using lots of drugs, um, and again, on that dependency side or the problematic side where it's causing issues, that should be an indicator as your society that something's not right. Likewise, if you had a zoo where all the animals are trying to get drunk off fermented fruits, something's probably not right in that zoo. They're not happy in the environment they're in. And some of you probably come across rat park experiments, things like that. It's the same kind of concept. You know, if you have the right society, um, you shouldn't have these kind of problems in the same way. And the last little thing I'd like to do, um, I, I forgot to mention it at the start, unfortunately, but there's this little link here, um, tinyl.com 4nu7w6w8. And it's the stigma-free tool. And what this does is it asks about 20, 30 questions, I think, and helps identify your unconscious biases for certain groups. And by everybody being here today, it's probably fair to say um, people who use sort of drugs and alcohol, you're not really stigmatizing of, but it will help hopefully identify maybe a few groups there that you may not have thought about. And it's worth doing because it makes you think you could have somebody walk in, speak to you who's using drugs or alcohol, you could be perfectly fine, and they might mention something relating to one of those other groups, and you suddenly get a bit standoffish. Not intentionally, but it could be one of those things where you might just pause, it might be something you don't know about. But as somebody on the other side of that, you might notice that kind of change in facial expression um, and suddenly the barriers might come up and you might lose that kind of interaction with that person. So I do recommend having a little look at that and kind of exploring, um, exploring those unconscious biases of your own as well. The second thing is to think about where your stereotypes come from. So throughout the day, uh, have a little think about, is it something you've read in the media? Um, was it like me with school, that it was just, that's what they taught us back in the day and it stuck with me for years? Um, and also find one topic that you don't know about. So don't do this today, but in the next few days, ideally, um, anything comes out of this, what don't you know about? What can you look into to try and look at that ignorant side of yourself? What can you change there as well? And again, at the end of today, hopefully do something different because of today. So in my workshop, we'll cover a few ways to come up with a plan and what I call a bold step. So something you can do when you go back to work um, to just start the ball rolling on something. And there we go. So thank you very much. I'm a psychotherapist in Guernsey Prison, where I've been a um, psychotherapist for 21 years. Um, some would say that's a bit of a life sentence, um, but I have to admit that, confess, that I have enjoyed almost all of it. Um, and I would like to pay tribute to the people of Guernsey who I've worked with in prisons, who have taught me so much about what it is to survive trauma. Um, and have shared so much so honestly about the stigma that they have encountered and about what it takes to survive trauma. Sorry, I've got a bit of a croaky throat. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a bit about the impact and consequences of stigma on prisoner care um, and the outcomes for their children and families. Um, a bit about judgment, a bit about social attitudes and social policy. So the Oxford English Dictionary um, says that stigma is a mark of disgrace associated with particular circumstances, qualities or person. And the um, example that they give is the stigma of having gone to prison will always be with me. Interesting enough, that's the example that they give of stigma. Um, which obviously ripples out into how we view people who end up in prisons. 
Um, so all of you who are Guardian readers, I came across this article um, about whose disgrace is it? Um, and Eva argues um, that in fact um, it's the UK prison system that is the disgrace, that is the stain on our society rather than the people who end up in them. Um, so what's gone wrong? Um, and she says that the biggest disgrace is um, that it doesn't work, that 65% of people go back within two years of having left, um, that there's a huge financial and social cost associated with incarceration, that we lock up more women and children than the West of Europe, um, that we swing in terms of our political orientation, we swing from wanting to punish people, to, to deter people, or to reform. So in the lifetime of Conservative government, there's been Rory Stewart, um, who was Justice Minister, and he had very much a reform agenda, and Chris Grayling, who very much had a, um, a deterrent agenda. Um, and Chris Grayling actually is um, famous for his faux pas in actually saying that he um, wanted to stop prisoners from having too many books in their cells um, because books were regarded as a perk and a privilege. Um, so he wanted to stop people from having books. Um, and actually that was, um, well, too many books. Um, and that um, decision was overturned in 2015 um, by um, the courts. So you have to say, you know, if, if that's how um, politicians think, that a book is a perk, um, then that is driving some of the ideas behind social policy. Um, so social policy can be confused and confusing and is often not evidence-led. So what is the prison population made up from? It's actually principally made up um, of people who are extremely disadvantaged. Um, so 30% of um, males who come to prison have been children in care, and 60% of females who come to prison have been children in care as compared with 1% of the average population. So if you're looking about at trauma survivors, 46% of women in prison are victims of domestic abuse. 53% of them report that they've been abused as children, and 27% of men report that they have been abused as children. Um, prisoners and the children of prisoners are at much higher risk of being um, exposed to ACEs. I think we haven't got time to go into ACEs, they're adverse childhood experiences. Um, there's a lot on the internet should you want to read up about it, um, but I think most people are aware of what they are. In fact, um, having a parent go to prison is one ace. Um, so this knowledge that we are looking after people who are extremely sh uh, traumatised should inform how we care for prisoners and support their families. So the incidence of mental ill health and social disadvantage is extremely high amongst any given prison population. So 25% um, is from a minority background as compared with 10% of the average population. Um, the Norwegians who, um, in fact the Scandinavians, have got more right than most um, nationalities in managing um, offenders. And they, um, this is from a, a study from Norway, um, and they say that the, uh, they studied the incidence of psychiatric disorders, and they said that 90% fit the criteria for needing drug or alcohol support, that 80% of prisoners would fit a diagnosis of personality disorder. Um, so prison adds another level of stigma to those already stigmatised. Um, in Guernsey Prison, and um, 
I think in some parts of the UK. Um, we've taken a particular interest in trying to support the families of um, prisoners um, and their children. Um, there's a very high incidence of trauma in prisoner population. Um, there's a higher incidence of depression and anxiety amongst the children of prisoners. Um, and children often talk of feeling bereaved in losing a member of their family to prison. Um, their grief is largely disenfranchised. If someone dies, you can talk about it. You can say how sad you feel. Um, but if your family member's gone to prison, because it carries such stigma with it, it's really difficult to talk about it. And it can make people, children feel it highly anxious. Um, they often have issues in school and we are trying to reach out to schools. Um, we run a programme in the prison called Hidden Sentence. It's called Hidden Sentence because families um, serve a sentence alongside their family member. And we run that along with the Education um, Council. So we are uh, very much trying to link up with people working with children um, to help support children who come into prison to visit family members. Um, there's an appalling statistic which I have always found deeply shocking, which is that 65% of male children of male offenders will end up in the um, criminal justice system. Um, it's a really, really sad statistic and one that I think we should really think long and hard about and try and help, particularly male children. Um, because they tend to deal with things in different ways, um, girls tend to internalise and boys tend to externalise, they tend to act things out. Um, so much has been written very recently, um, only in the last few years has it really come on board in terms of study, but the stigmatisation of the children and families of people who commit sexual offences. Um, it's a very good study, um, Hextall 2022, um, and in that study they talk about the hierarchy of shame um, that spills out onto partners and children. Um, it obviously largely depends also upon the severity of the offence, um, but social attitudes, um, stigma would say that things like um, apple, the apple never falls far from the tree. So the families and children of uh, people who commit sex sexual offences tend to get linked up with um, negative views. Um, and there's minimal sympathy for family members who want to maintain a family relationship. Um, with somebody who commits a sexual offence. Um, so if we're looking at what works, um, being truly trauma-informed um, versus being trauma-aware, obviously it helps to be trauma-aware, um, but um, it really is very, very important to be trauma-informed. Um, through a trauma-informed lens, suddenly everything starts to look different you start to have different conversations with people in prisons. And you start talking about you, what happened to you as opposed to what is wrong with you. And the conversation is instantly different. It becomes respectful and it becomes collaborative. Um, the Scandinavians have moved very quickly in terms of trauma-informed social care and their reconviction rate is 20% as opposed to uh, 65 which is a huge difference. So they do many things right. And I hope we do some things too <laughs> that are right um, because we're trying to learn. Um, so in terms of what trauma-informed looks like, so trauma-informed prison care looks at education. It looks at helping prisoners rise above the causes of their stigma. Um, it's all about doing needs-led interventions rather than what you think might be right, is actually following the research, following the science and looking at what will actually make a difference. Um, the organisation needs to commit to evidence-based change. And I think that's what we've been doing since 2017. Um, and that's growing fast, I think, now. 
um, we're getting on a bit of a wave um, and really committing to being trauma informed in Guernsey Prison. Um, we need informed and inspiring leadership, no pressure there John, um, but it truly does come from the top, um, that you can't achieve anything unless your management um, are on board with change and understand what you're trying to do. Um, so um, we've been making use um, of lived experience. We've been asking um, prisoners to help us to educate ourselves and other people um, about trauma, about um, all aspects of their lives, um, what's led to them coming to prison and what will help them stay out of prison. Um, they also help each other. We have many peer-led initiatives, but in the workshop that um, I'm doing, um, we'll talk some more about that. Um, one of the things about being trauma-informed is that it's on the understanding that distress is a universal human experience. It's not something that happens to other people. We all understand it. We have all experienced distress. Therefore, I understand some things about trauma. It's what unites us rather than divides us. Um, the most common diagnosis in any prison is a diagnosis of personality disorder. Um, public and professional knowledge about personality disorder is very low. Um, and mostly people view people with personality disorder um, as people who purposely misbehave. Um, so where we need to be um, putting our resources is in training to improve stigmatising attitudes with health providers, with family members, criminal justice system and law enforcement providers. There's a need for positive messages about recovery. People who have a diagnosis of personality disorder um, often feel that no change is possible. Um, and frequently professionals also believe that, that no change is possible. Um, and you have sayings such as lepers never change their spots, um, which is a terribly pessimistic message to give anybody. Um, and access to treatment is massively important. Um, so we need to um, research and target our education um, in reducing stigma and improving outcomes. Um, we have worked um, very closely over the last couple of years with Autism Guernsey, who've been really generous in sharing with us resources um, and working with our prisoners. 10% um, of our population at Guernsey Prison um, is accessing services, um, so support groups and one-to-one um, -one help in um, support for um, being autistic. Being autistic in a prison is obviously a very tough place to live uh, because there are lots of things that are really difficult for um, people with autism. Loud noises, clanging, lots of bright lights, um, lots of very difficult situations, um, lots of change, so continually moving cells, um, lots of things like that that are very difficult for people with autism to, to cope with. Um, but we've um, had very good um, feedback about um, the help and support that we're able to give people. Uh, our education department um, is expanding massively and we're moving towards being able to offer people vocational training. We're a working prison. We also um, ask um, prisoners to become prisoner mentors. So prisoners are teaching prisoners. So um, on my programme, so um, we deliver um, the decider programme. We also deliver offence related courses and prisoners um, act as mentors, so they teach other people. They use their lived experience to talk about how um, they've got through difficult situations, how they've survived trauma, how they've survived stigma, um, how they've su um, survived difficult situations. 
Um, so we are now um, putting lots and lots of resources into professional training, um, new recruits and existing st staff, um, and we're teaching them about being trauma-informed. Um, prisoners also are becoming involved in that, um, in being able to um, help um, prison, uh, prison officers understand what it's like to be a prisoner. Um, because until I've been a prisoner, I don't know what that's like. I can only imagine, despite having worked there for 21 years, I go home at night, um, I don't know what it's like to be locked up, not to be able to get out. Um, and not, I don't know what it's like to experience the kind of stigmatisation that they do um, in coming out of prison. So the Hidden Sentence course is a course that we run in the prisons, so we invite people to come into the prison to, be, um, to experience what it's like um, to be in some areas of the prison. Um, and we teach, um, and prisoners teach what it's like um, to um, be a child of a prisoner. So some of them themselves have been a child of a prisoner and they now are serving prisoners. Um, and they also talk and share their experience of being um, prisoner, prisoner parents and what's that, what that's like. And their partners are very generous with their time and they come in <coughs> and they also talk about what it's like to be um, the partner of a prisoner and what it's like to look after children who are spun into that bereavement response. So we share responsibility with prisoners for teaching, learning and finding solutions. Um, that old adage, you know, that if you feel like you're just part of the problem, then it's very difficult to be part of the solution, but I think it stands up. And when you can become involved in being creative about sharing information, um, then that's, that's a good thing. Um, we're also moving towards providing more staff and more support for staff and being aware that if you work in a prison, you are exposed to primary um, traumatisation and also to secondary trauma. Um, so what's the evidence for change? So the evidence is that in 2021, 32% of released prisoners without su supervision reoffended within two years. So this is our local statistic. So 32 is not bad. Um, and that's without supervision. And then the good news is that in 2021, 14% of prisoners leaving prison with supervision returned to custody <laughs> within two years. So if we compare ourselves with UK statistics, we're doing okay. No room for complacency, but it's a good news story um, that some of the things that we are doing perhaps are the right things. Thank you.